I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to open with the annual uh, Board of Finance meeting. As all of you are probably aware, we constitute the Board of Finance. And we'll begin with the election of a president and the nominations. In the past, have we not done it just with the same board, same officers as before? I think so. I make a motion for that. Yeah. Makes it simple. <laughs> for both positions, man. Yeah, for every position. Okay. So, yeah. So, is that all in favor of that? Say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We have a board elected. Chris, you're going to report on investments and lead us through the presentation. Yes. Let me make sure that you can use um, So, this is just a financial statement as far as any investments. We don't really have any investments. However, we do earn uh, interest. Um, and so there's just a little bit of information on how our um, current accounts are uh, with our uh, First Farmers Bank. A few years ago, uh, we <coughs> asked to have a, a kind of a floor put on those investments. Um, that was kind of during that COVID time when our interest rates were dropping considerably, uh, which they did oblige to that. And so we've maintained that. It will be um, the rate floor for this, this coming school year is at 0.15%. Um, if you look at what our interest earned uh, for 2022, is significantly higher than what's been over the last couple years um, and really that's due to just the increase of interest rates and the cash balances that we have sitting in our accounts and so our our rate has varied this is through the whole calendar year from anywhere between 0.15 percent which is our floor rate up to 3.81 percent i think i think we're even over four right now so um, that's good uh, because of our cash balance and because of the higher interest rate uh, we were able to incur um, a revenue of interest of two hundred eight thousand dollars for the calendar year of 2022 which if you look at it historically that's one of the higher uh, interest earned that we've had in a long long time so that just fluctuates, like I said, but by interest rates and then the amount of cash balances we have in our accounts there. Any questions with that? Okay. Then moving on, uh, by Indiana Code, we are to have a, a finance meeting and discuss certain things uh, within that uh, meeting. And so I just created a PowerPoint here that we'll go through and look at um, those things. So um, Jeff, a lot of this stuff will probably be new for you, but back in the fall, we adopted a budget for 2023. And when we adopt a budget, then we submit that budget to the Department of Local Government and Finance who then approves or tells us that we need to reduce our budget. And so um, that first column there, uh, the budget we have to submit is only representing uh, four funds, and that's the Education, Operations, Debt, Service, and Rainy Day funds. For calendar year 2022, it shows what we actually spent in those funds. The second column shows what our budget was that was approved in that fall meeting for 2023. The DLGF told us what our budget should be 
in those funds after we submitted our expenses and revenues. There were no reductions in any of those uh, budgets that we submitted. So those numbers remain the same as far as what we approved. And then um, as part of our 1782 notice, it gives us what our assessed valuation is for a corporation and our tax rate for a corporation. And you can see that our operations fund has a tax rate of basically 54 cents, which will generate, should generate uh, $4.6 million. And then our debt service has a tax rate of 17 cents, essentially, and it will generate uh, $1.5 million of uh, revenue in those funds. And then the last column represents what the anticipated tax cap impact will be, uh, which shows that we could lose, uh, as an estimate, up to $243,000 dollars of that revenue we wouldn't collect basically um, so this shows what uh, our budget uh, was estimated at total and what percentage each of those were obviously our education operation fund is the uh, bigger amount uh, not much changed with that uh, since nothing changed with our appropriations. Our education fund estimate budget that we set uh, shows uh, what that $14.9 million is separated out into, uh, primarily salary and benefits, which are a bigger chunk, about 91%. After an adjustments, um, you know, because we set our budget in September, we don't even know what our like negotiation salary raises and all that type of stuff is going to be. So there's obviously changes that need to happen. We don't know what our vocational dollars are going to be and all that stuff till like December. So we make those adjustments then to that budget that we set as long as we don't go over the amount of dollars that we request that we said we would spend. Um, so you can see it changes but it doesn't change drastically typically so we're still at uh, you know showing 91 percent in our salary and benefits for the most part uh, that we won't necessarily have to go over but i just kind of laid out some historical comparisons uh, when it comes to what those budgets have been over the past several years just as a comparison uh, net assessed valuation again we look at that when we set our budget we get our final numbers when we get that from the DLGF. You can see that our assessed valuation improved almost 13%. Uh, so it went from 760 million to 857 million, which is important because that the higher assessed valuation uh, can lower your tax rate uh, and still generate the same amount of dollars. This is a historical view of what our assessed valuation has done over time. Uh, the blue is the actual and the red is the estimate. And if you remember back in like April, May, when we were talking with the referendum, we had policy analytics come in and kind of give us a preview of what, you know, anticipated growth might be in our assessed valuation. And so that's what that red represents. 2023, um, Budgets are completed for uh, taxing units. This is a comparison of ours. Um, it's not updated on the uh, program that I use, so I kind of updated with that black line to show where our 71 cents would kind of sit uh, for 2023 as a comparison to previous, the past 10 years or so. This is a new slide that I got back in December. Um, IASGO puts on a, uh, a session and they usually invite um, Dr. Larry DeBoer, who is a Purdue uh, econ economist, I guess is what it's called. Um, and so these are where our uh, school district would sit compared to other school districts across the state of Indiana as tax rate is concerned. So uh, 
71 cents is below the 10 percent percentile um, where the median is around a dollar to dollar three uh, and that was for 2022. Uh, this is a comparison. Again, 2023 budgets are completed, but they're not updated on the on the software. So uh, eventually we'll review this again at another point in time. But just looking at 2022, this is where we compared uh, tax rates from our border schools. And then the graph on the right just shows how much levy amount of dollars were generated from that tax rate for those school districts. This also came from Dr. DeBoer's presentation. Uh, it kind of shows you a historical uh, rate, interest rate for uh, municipal bonds. And you can see that uh, municipal bonds are on the rise, but still historically low in comparison uh, from many years. And so right now they're sitting um, around three and a half percent. So they went down even a little bit. Operation fund um, budget that we submitted, I broke it up into different categories because our operation fund really covers so many different uh, operation overhead sides. So you can see, you know, how much is that is general administration, how much of that is marketing, technology, maintenance, custodial, all those different types of services we provide. Uh, in capital projects and so forth. So you can see that breakdown of that $8.9 million that we anticipated uh, spending. Then you go to the next slide. And then that's the actual budget for 2023. Uh, again, the appropriation amount does not change, but some things uh, may have changed based off of other things that have happened between, between the time the budget was submitted and the end of this calendar year. The last thing we have to review is the school corporation fiscal indicators. Uh, the DUAB, which is the Distressed Units Appeal Board, puts out um, information or data related to every school corporation. And they highlight certain financial aspects of that school corporation to determine if there is any uh, distressed units. Uh, and so this is found on the website of the DUAB, uh, which stands for the Distressed Units Appeal Board, and they highlight every school corporation. So we have to review our school corporation's fiscal indicators. So there it shows you what our 21-22 student fall count was and what our 2022 20, net assessed valuation uh, was and the estimated population in the county from 2019. Understand that this information that they are showing us ends at, uh, on December 2021. So it's not even December 2022's information. So it's a year behind. So they're always a year behind on this data uh, that they share. So this is based off of 2021 end of calendar year. So one thing they look at as a fiscal indicator is ADM. Obviously, that's a huge revenue source uh, for our education fund and all the other school corporations education fund. And a big fluctuation in ADM could have an impact on school corporation. So this just shows what uh, our spring and fall counts were uh, over the past several years. You can see we've been kind of stabilized for the most part at least the last three or four years. We can see uh, from this graph, you know, we've had that huge drop uh, for about eight, nine years, and then we've just been kind of fluctuating up and down uh, a little more steady over the last three or four years. The other thing they look at is your fund balances. Um, they want to know what kind of balance that you have in case of emergency situations and if you're able to kind of fund and pay for things that you need to pay for uh, on a daily basis. And so you can see there um, all the different funds. Um, back in 2019, they combined funds. And so that's why you see some of the different colors and some of the colors no longer really existing. 
the education fund obviously is a big fund for us that's in the orange you can see the increase there operation fund is a big fund for us as well uh, that's yellow you can see the increase in there and then the one fund that you might notice is the one that is in the negative uh, which uh, was a big negative back in 2015 16 17 18 that was a self-insurance fund you can see that no longer exists uh, and that was that was corrected and, and taken care of back in 2021. Can you point out too, as far as the federal funds? So federal funds would include things like our Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV grants that we receive dollars for. Uh, it also include any ESSER funds that we perhaps uh, have spent. But typically federal funds are in the negative because those are reimbursable funds. So we have to pay those monies out before we can get reimbursement from them. This just shows you kind of something similar, but in a line graph, I, I kept track of this myself. Uh, on this line graph, you can see how our education fund has grown over time, our operations fund has grown over time, and our food service fund has grown over time. Those are the funds that I usually keep cash flow spreadsheets on uh, because we want to kind of make sure that we have a better understanding of those funds and what's coming in and out of them. The next thing that the do app looks at for fiscal indicators is um, if there was any deficit or surplus from year to year. And so this represents all of our funds um, and it shows in green the revenue and it shows in blue the expenses. Uh, and then any surplus would be in yellow. And you can see that we've uh, done well uh, over the past several years in um, controlling our revenue and expenses so that we do end up with a surplus uh, at the end of the year. This is my own graph of that. I kind of, I just like to look at this visual because what I've shown here is that um, and this is for the education fund, um, the basic grant, which is the dollars we get for students compared to the total <coughs> revenue in that fund, which is the green compared to the expenditures. So what I like to do is make sure that our budget is balanced by making sure our basic grant and expenditures are pretty similar. And so then the total revenue, anything above that is just extra for the most part, building up those balances um, for surplus for things that may come down the road uh, for uh, salary improvements and those types of things. Because you understand that most of the money that's being spent out of that fund are for salary and benefits. And you can see how that compares to our ADM, which is that line graph in there um, as well. So. The next thing the DOAB looks at are your fund balances as a percent of operation expenditures. And you can see out of all of our funds, we have a fund balance that is 80% of our expenditures. So pretty strong there. The next thing they look at is your revenue stream <coughs> and the type of revenue that you're getting in um, and seeing if there's any major changes in revenue uh, growth or decrease. And so this just shows you that as far as you know, kind of where our federal revenue, how much of that is federal, how much of it is state revenue, how much is of it is debt revenue, how much of it is local property tax revenue, et cetera. So you can see how that uh, plays out there um, as far as our total revenue is concerned. And local tax revenue is about flat line, isn't it? <clears throat> Uh, the next indicator doesn't apply to us, but it's something that, that uh, the DOAB considers important because if you're having to borrow a lot of money, I guess, to continue to operate, I guess they would see that as a potential negative. We don't have an operating referendum, so we don't receive any uh, revenue from local property tax through an operational referendum. 
An operational referendum, just so you know, Jeff, is a referendum that school corporations would put out that would fund salaries and benefits, which is different than the referendum that we tried to pass for capital projects. And then uh, I like to review our SWOT analysis uh, at the end of the year as we talk about our goals. Um, so we went over this before we talked about this back even when we were looking at the referendum, <coughs> but you know, some of our strengths of the corporation we feel like are is our assessed valuation, the fact that we have debt falling off, uh, we have a uh, good cash balances. We are impacted um, as much by tax cap impacts. And then we do have uh, good student transfers from other places outside of our district. Some of our weaknesses, uh, you know, uh, student capacity in some of our buildings, uh, which is different than, uh, I consider that different than um, programming capacity in our buildings, uh, because obviously programming is driven a lot, not only by us, by, but by through the DOE, through changes and requirements that they uh, push out. Um, double services uh, in some of our buildings, primarily our high schools, uh, the age of our buildings and just needing some facility updates and, you know, just really a lack of a long range facility plan and a, a lack of a debt plan that would play into that facility plan, especially with the debt falling off. Optimal times to um, focus on those things and build those things out. And Dr. Kuhn and I um, discussed this a little bit about the lack long range facility plan. We really worked on that, um, and obviously we had a plan, but um, that didn't go through. So something else we will have to continue to look at. So, but um, if the referendum would have passed, I think we would have taken that off of there as far as a weakness. So, but it did not. So we're moving forward. Then looking at low oppor or opportunities uh, again um, with our good assessed valuation that allows us to manage our tax rate. Uh, with our tax rate being low, that's an opportunity for revenues to fund things like capital projects, um, develop and manage a, some type of tax rate plan um, and a debt plan with that capital project plan. Uh, we can always look at continue to expand and build on our out of district transfers uh, through some of our marketing and other things, and then just you know that developing of the long range facility plan or long range uh, other planning. Uh, kind of goes hand in hand with the tax rate debt plan. Threats, and these things can happen at any time and, you know, unannounced for the most part, you know, decline enrollment. You never know uh, what your ADM is going to be from year to year. We have another ADM count in February. Coming up February 1st will be the next count. You could have more students, you could have less students. If you have less students, you lose the money that you've already built your budget for. <laughs> So, you know, those are always threats that can come and go. State legislation, uh, this is a big year uh, for state legislation because it's a budget year. So they're building out their budget. We could receive funding uh, increases. We could not. Uh, funding could go to other things. Uh, so that, that always has impacts on what laws they put out there as well, impacts uh, school districts. Uh, resistance to just facility needs and upgrades, um, you know, things that uh, are going to improve our buildings. Sometimes people may not really understand or, or want to understand the importance of some of those things. Uh, TIF impacts. There are some TIF districts that uh, sit in our district. Uh, those usually have tax impacts. Um, but I think we have three TIF districts, uh, maybe four, now with some of those housing projects. And now we have four, yes. But you know, those are things that uh, can be good and can be can can be harmful uh, if not uh, taken care of. And then um, other threats, just you know, the programming that I talked about. You know, a lot of those things uh, aren't always mandated by us, but you know, sometimes we have to offer or try to provide things that maybe we're not ready for or we don't have the facilities for. Uh, and then uh, just any unexpected growing costs. The pandemic was an example of you know some unexpected growing costs, inflation, 
comes and goes from time to time. There are other things that can happen that you know you just don't plan for um, that have an impact on on districts, including us. So. And I'd just like to add, though, the declining role, like Dr. Kuhn said, it, it is, it could be, well, it, it's always a threat, uh, but fortunately, the last two years in Misty Walvis County um, had an increase uh, both in the fall and the spring last year, and then a, a more significant one this fall. Um, and then next Wednesday is our day again, so February 1st. And it gets really tricky when, when you even get a little more specific with it, like you have a grade level that has a very small amount of kids and then how do you prepare and plan for that um that type of stuff so that can go along with it as far as financial goals are we set these goals a couple years ago and i just like to review them i think they're good goals to continue to uh, reflect on and pay attention to so one of our goals is to maintain an education fund balance as equivalent or better than three months of expenses while being able to increase pay benefits and other programming needs so I've laid out the last three years just to kind of show you what that monthly average has been in those three years of expenses out of the education fund, what that three months average equates to, and then what our end of the year fund balance actually is. So we're, we're doing well uh, with those goals. The second goal is the same except for the operation <coughs> fund. So there it lays out what our uh, monthly averages have been in expenses out of our operation fund. Uh, and what that three month average is and then how that compares to our end of the year balance. Then the last goal is to increase our rainy day fund to 10% of what our education operation fund budget is. So our budget for 2023 out of the education operation fund, when you combine them, is 23 million or 23.8 million. 10% of that would be 2.3 million. Uh, and our end of, or our beginning of the year balance then for rainy day sits at 1.6 million to 1.7 million. So we're getting closer to that goal, but that again, that just takes some time uh, to continue to build that up. Wow, 6:28. We were anticipating 30 minutes. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes of questions. Time to spare. <laughs> questions or thoughts for Chris? Excellent presentation, Chris, I appreciate the effort that you put into all of this. So the rainy day fund will increase this year. So to build that up to 2.4, basically, it'll take a number of years to do that. Unless sure. we just really pump something in. Right, there. right. Which we've built, you know, I guess one of the positive things with the self-insurance <clears throat> issue is that we built that pattern into this mm -hmm. uh, with the rainy day. So we have that kind of strat strategically built in so we can at least for now I'll continue to um, put some extra funding into that rainy day fund um, to build it up as we go but you do well you have to remember too that with that um, it was a little over three million dollars so if you add that three million dollars to this right. um look at what that would have been too yeah. but that, that's kind of my point too mike that fund is not very old no it, no. Was, it was used to get rid of salt insurance so it's it's a it's a great thing and then when we set that up we had parameters mm -hmm. or whatever what the right. use of that fund could be used for and yeah. i forget all the specifics but it just can't, be used, for, yeah, uh, just can't be used for anything. No. Okay. No. Chris, so, I was wondering on the operations fund, what have we done to make it? I mean, our monthly averages went down over the last three years. So what's been done to drop those expenses, I guess? Uh, well, first, some of that is um, Again, not necessarily staffing, just some adjustments in staffing over time. Uh, we've done some things to kind of uh, help within our buildings to be a little bit more efficient. Uh, like we did the lighting projects at Northfield and Southwood where we retrofitted everything to LED uh, to kind of cut some of those types of costs. Um, we've done some things which uh, we'll talk about another time, just even like with some vendors that we use. like. I, <clears throat> changing over our insurance to another vendor, which is going to end up saving us some money uh, in the long term. Um, 
but we've also had some bonds that we've been able to work off of as well so that we don't have some of those larger capital project expenses coming out of the operational fund. Student enrollment, do you expect to bump up again like the previous years? Do you have In the spring? Yeah. Yeah, not this. Yeah. We looked at that right now, so it, it should bump up, not maybe as significant than last year from fall to spring, but uh, we looked at those numbers. So we are anticipating yeah. a, yeah. a little bit of an increase in ADM. Yeah. Anything from that side of the table? <laughs> <laughs> if not, we're going to adjourn the annual board of finance meeting at 6 31. Well, I have to it. Looks like Mr. Martin's going to bring in the group that's coming in next. Yeah, perfect. All right, we'll call to order the regular board trustees meeting for MSD of Wabash County. Future board meetings will be on the 14th and the 28th of February, and then also the 14th of March. All of that here at the regular meeting time and the regular meeting place. <clears throat> no revisions of agenda apart from the human resource uh, additions. So we'll move on into public recognition and approve some wonderful donations. We have a $100 donation from an anonymous donor for Southwest Wrestling, $3,000 donation from an anonymous donor for Southwest Softball, and then a $250 donation from Craig and Tanya uh, Coppice for, uh, for Northfield FCA. I move to accept all those donations. Okay. Everyone in favor of approving donations, say aye. Aye. Close. We want to thank them again. Thank you, anonymous donors. Staff spotlight. All right. Um, this is one of the favorite part of our, our meeting. So I would like, and I know you just came in perfect timing. So Mr. Schinkel, if you can come up here. And I have not met Mrs. Swig, but you are. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. So we, we typically would have our um, introductions prior, but we had the Board of Finance earlier. So just come on with over here. So um, yeah, there we go. So actually, Dr. Kuhn has uh, the camera right there on me now. So yeah. <laughs> and you, you are on Facebook Live, so and then you can see this afterwards. But uh, oh, six or eight thousand. Yes. Yeah, 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 you know, it's, yeah, it's gone up uh, since you just came up here. So anyway, so our staff spotlight uh, from Sharp Creek, fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Deb Schinkel, and Mrs. Swick is the one that nominated her. And so I'll just give you an opportunity to go ahead and share uh, what you uh, wrote um, in the application. So I had nominated Mrs. Schinkel because my daughter was new to the district this year and she came in kind of a little reluctant with reading like she could do it, but it was, it was painful. So we had gotten this letter in the desk and Mrs. Schinkel like had this, the child at the end of the school year write a letter to the new student, kind of what to expect. And in there it said, we hope you like to read. And she was like, I'm not going to read. <laughs> so then uh, I was like, it'll be fine. But you know, Mrs. Schinkel does a really good job doing like read-alongs with the kids and then giving them small goals so that it's achievable so it doesn't feel overwhelming. So she, I guess I was just told that is the top reader in her class. Mm -hmm. And she's routinely found up past bedtime reading <laughs> and um, has a little nightlight in there apparently as of this morning so, <laughs> so she's doing fabulous and I thank you because that's like a lifetime yes. skill that you can give to somebody like she can find any answer now because she's confident so thank you so much and so, so while you're still up here why don't you go ahead and introduce your daughter um, and your other guest so we oh, know who's here okay this is Elizabeth she's um in fourth grade and my mom, Tina McMullen. All right, thanks for coming. Elizabeth, and it was interesting reading what your mom wrote, though, because I thought it was interesting that you were staying up a little too late, but it's great that you're reading. You're <laughs> but you, need your, you do need your sleep, too, though, so keep that in mind. So. <laughs> um, Mr. Martin, do you want to say anything while you're well, the principal? I just appreciate that, that a mother would take the time to uh, to be so kind as to say what anything and uh, share this. and. 
and the corporation doing this. And, and Elizabeth, is there anything you're specifically liking reading right now? What kind of books are you? I don't know what you got there. Is there a series or anything that's? Yeah, series. Babysitters Club. Those have been popular for a while. Yeah. Been, and and the well deserved Mrs. Shankle. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to say anything? I just thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's give a round of applause. What we've done over the years, um, First Farmers Bank and Trust is kind of like their sponsor for this um, for some donations. And so uh, typically we would have different things, but uh, MSD of Walvers County is starting um, their own um, online store. Yeah, an online store. And so you will get a $40 voucher uh, when that opens up to buy whatever you want from it could be an MSD, but obviously it could be a Shark Creek item also too. So anyway, that would be nice and, and we should probably give you something because that's how she's getting down. Okay. <laughs> anyway, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. We'll move on to the school recognition. Yep, so Mr. Martin, I'll let you go ahead um, and do your thing as far as introduction of the people that are here and what they're going to do and i guess i do need to ask do you want me to connect? i do have that do you want me to connect to it okay let me go ahead and connect uh get out of here would you like for me to do a couple of other recognitions that i've just typed on sure here? go ahead while i'm doing that. that that'd be okay. great um chart creek elementary pe teacher gary norman recently submitted his retirement letter effective at the end of the school year uh, and also tonight and I hope this isn't out of line, but it will become official that Mrs. Tina Riggle will retire from teaching at the end of the school year. So at this time, on behalf of uh, all Shark Creek Elementary students and staff, and that's both past and present, uh, I just want to say thank you to Gary and Tina for their many, many years of service, for their dedication to the uh, very serious responsibility of, of inspiring and motivating kids to, uh, to dream big and work hard. And uh, we're going to miss them both. And I just wanted to make sure I did that tonight because I'm not sure that it'll work out for me personally, but uh, uh, very happy for both of them and their next big challenges or whatever they take on. So. And then uh, also, uh, I just wanted to recognize the uh, paraprofessionals we have at Sharp Creek who are doing a wonderful job uh, this school year. And we have quite a few, Deb Elliott, Sarah Aderman, Tammy Sloan, Teresa Coe, Melissa Metz, Tricia Miracle, and Carrie Pugh. And uh, we're just so fortunate to have also uh, Lisa Beaver, who's our technology assistant in the building, and her wisdom and knowledge is available to both students and staff. But, but that group of paraprofessionals, including Lisa Beaver, uh, they are a big part of what we do every day, and they're working with kids on a regular basis, and it all is a very positive arrangement. So thank you to them. And now I'm ready to give All right. a quick spiel. Okay. Uh, so we have with us our Sharp Creek fourth grade teachers uh, this evening. And they're going to do a presentation, a brief presentation on Camp Tecumseh, um, which is uh, a trip that all of our students as fourth graders have the chance to, uh, the opportunity to participate in each year. Uh, we're fortunate to have teachers and staff members and many volunteers, whether that's parents or others, who are willing to do the, the work necessary to provide this great opportunity and learning experience uh, that is unique and memorable. And so closest to me is uh, Mrs. Kim Bear. You've met Mrs. Deb Shankleton this evening and Mrs. Kelly Ross. This is our fourth grade team and I appreciate them being willing to be here, share just a little bit. But this is, this is an example of what MSD, Sharp Creek, I mean, it's just amazing to me the trips that our kids get to have and the opportunities for all the grade levels. So uh, this is an example of a really unique and good opportunity. So ladies, I'll be quiet. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle. You can stand with your back to the wall if you want. Yeah. That probably be the, best. I have the TV screen on the TV. Screen. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just tell me when you want me to switch slides? Here? Okay. All right. So we're just going to tell you a little bit how we got connected with Camp Tecumseh and then what we do while we're there. So go ahead and, okay. So Camp Tecumseh is located outside of Brookston, Indiana. So it's about an hour from here. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And it is a YMCA camp and they have year round programs um, for students and then they have facilities that like church groups can go in, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, I mean anybody. So we um, are involved with the history side of it and we do what's called Pioneer Heritage. So that's our group that we took this year. So if you go ahead and flip it again, please. Um, how we got started is just a few years ago, when Mrs. Baker was teaching fourth grade and I got the privilege to work with her. We got this pamphlet and I said, this looks kind of interesting. And she took it and she came back. She goes, I think we need to go because it'll be all hands on for the kids, not just the textbook. And so we went and the first year we went, we went in December and we told the kids, it was called um, Christmas in the Colonies. And we told the kids, you got to dress really warm, you know, you're going to need hats and you're going to need snowsuits and all this. We get there and it's beautiful. They don't have to wear their snowsuits. <laughs> yeah. It's sunny, it's warm, no wind. And it was a really cool program. Um, as I said, it was Christmas. So they um, they yule logs, um, they got to shoot BB guns, those kinds of things. They made quilt blocks. And so then the next year, we got to go back. Um, but it was way below zero when we were supposed to go. So the school board said, I don't think you should go now. So then we got switched to May and it was like 90 degrees and mosquitoes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we switched our program to then the Pioneer Heritage. And um, it's a two day, one night overnight stay. So it kind of gives the kids a little bit of what's going to happen when they go to fifth and sixth grade camp. Um, it's just close to home. Um, one night and everybody seems to have a great time. So that's how we got started there and we've been very blessed to be able to go, I won't tell you how many years. <laughs> yes. I think I saw 1985. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. I think Kim and I were talking with fourth graders. <laughs> 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 Um, they do get to experience a lot of hands-on, and some of the things they get to do is have fin fishing, where they just have a stick and a string and a hook. And this year, we actually had quite a few that caught fish just mm -hmm. by real time fishing. Um, they do some animal trapping. They do Yankee ingenuity, which is where they take ropes and wrap them around. Picture. Um, yeah, yes, this picture right here, and so they kind of build a bridge or a ladder. Um, they also have a schoolhouse with some of the pioneer ways of teaching. Um, I think some of the kids, they get to experience the dunce cap, and so they, <laughs> they have a little fun with that. Um, they have hand up candle making. Mrs. Ross, she's going to take care of that. Um, cooking, they make johnny cakes and biscuits. Quilting, here's a sample of the quilting menu, and Mrs. Schenkel usually prepares all that, but the kids do the outline sewing. Um, Pathfinders, they take a walk and they use like the landmarks and directions to find their way through the trail. Um, they have barnyard games um, and learn about animals and then they have cabin building too. So a lot of hands on experiences, about 10 different stations they get to do. And then we'll flip the slide. And then we eat and have a dinner meal there at camp. We sit with eight to 10 people um, students and adults where they eat family style and then they are given a slip of paper where they have a skit that they have to go back to the cabins and work as a cabin and tell um, per try to perform it. They go then to the campfire that night and we sing songs, we do the campfire. Um, usually they ask Mrs. Schenkel to pick some of the chaperones and there's an adult one where <laughs> did you ever go, Scott? Oh, yeah. Okay, where you picked? <laughs> I didn't pick you. Galaxy is your own. Yes, that's what I thought. I thought. <laughs> so then we get parents involved <laughs> in um, a skit, and then one of my favorite things is we have a night hike. There's no flashlights. There's not supposed to be any talking, and they take us around through all over the camp, and they try to take us back to the pioneer spot. And if it's nice weather, um, one year we lay down on the ground, all in a circle, and we can look up at the constellations, and they told us a story. Um, 
and then we walk back. But it's just that's my favorite, and it wasn't even something the kids mentioned this year. But that's. Yeah. But that's, I don't think we did. But I, we didn't do it. We didn't. Oh, we well, walked well, back from yeah, the campfire. We were way back from a campfire that's way back in, but we didn't. Yes, we didn't do it. But that's yeah, that's usually mm -hmm. my favorite. So then we go back to our cabins, get ready, um, take showers, kids stay up a little past their <laughs> bedtime, <laughs> and then we're ready for the next day. Yeah. And then we finish up and head home. So these just shows some pictures. Um, the quilting, and then the other two are the pioneer cooking, where they grind. They have to grind corn, um, like the pioneers did, and then um, getting ready to make the biscuits. Looks like there's a person familiar in that bottom left-hand picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she went as a student and as a parent. So we're thankful for that. It's because you've only been doing it ten years. <laughs> slide is <clears throat> just kind of talk to the kids and this are some of the things that they said um, I like the one that says I was worried that they were missed their family because some of them had never been away from home overnight um, but they said oh it's working that's good and one said I didn't have to cut my brother <laughs> so, yeah so we just thank you for the opportunity to let fourth grade go um, we've enjoyed it and hopefully it can continue on I've been to several of those, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately. That's right. The nighttime thing is the, the hard thing for me. But scared of the dark? No. Yeah, right. That's what I my one's probably close to that. But I um what I really loved about love about these kind of opportunities is that the ingenuity, some of the kids that there's a lot of hands on, and so they don't get to experience that. I mean, my kids are on a farm, they get to have all kinds of that, but there's other kids that they don't have that. And uh, so when you see some of their brains just start working when they're tying knots or when they're trying to figure out a good way to cook a fish or, or things like that, it just kind of, you know, they're, they're too much on these and they don't get to experience the outside and so I, I I wish we could do more well you know when it comes to those kind of things it's just quite amazing well thank you let's give them a round of applause. thank you very much if you're, you're welcome to stay but you all <coughs> can leave if you like and Elizabeth I would tell you that you know, you might be able to stay up a little later tonight. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. She had her alarm because she thought that she needed to be online for the e learning by nine. Yes. So she didn't want to be late. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. We have not made an announcement, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll have to wait and see if it really happens or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. I really did through that trip and a number of times. Yeah. I had no idea what happens or what yeah. goes on there. I was two days. 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 Two no. <laughs> he just missed it. He, he was there at 84. Yeah. 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 I have a few more of us. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I have a few more of the student recognitions and staff recognitions, and I'll go ahead um, and begin with Southwood. So Southwood is proud of Duke Sparks and Caitlin Rank. They will be performing, or they have performed, actually, at the Indiana High School All-State Honor Choir um, at the MSC Theater um, this last Saturday. Qualifying for this choir is a very challenging process, so we are proud of these two, two students. Also, Southwood Junior Senior High recently received an exemplary re behavior report from the IHSAA submitted by one of the game officials. The report read, I was at WITCO on Friday, um, and that was actually on Friday the 13th. And I want to give a huge shout out to both teams, very kind and promoted sportsmanship. There was always a thank you or a yes, sir, even in a tough situation. These small things do not go unnoticed. Keep up the good work, guys. Um, from Northfield then, uh, Mr. Snyder wanted to recognize Ella France and Ella Gale, who advanced from the regional to state uh, for Northfield Girls Wrestling. 
a huge congratulations to sophomore uh, Ella Gale for winning an individual state championship. Ella pinned all three of her opponents at the level, state level on her way to the championship. And I also want to recognize that it's not in the script here, but uh, William Carroll, who is our new editor, new editor at Wabash Plain Dealer, he's been putting a lot of good articles in about uh, the great things that are happening at MSD of Wabash County. So we appreciate that. Um, also, Northfield, a couple weekends ago, visual art students from Northfield competed in the Scholastic Art Competition, the National Art Com Competition. Northfield students did an outstanding job and were awarded 26 different awards. Students who won awards include Emma Bone, Brianna Luker, Lane Deaton, Ella Gale, Emmy Haynes, Anna Kissel, J.C. Crumb, Skylar Lamson, Victoria Lane, Sage Martin, Maine uh, Nefer, Jessica Ray, Peyton Turley, and Emma Warnick. Congratulations and good luck as your projects continue on in the competition. And then also, uh, the last one I believe I have, uh, from Northfield, uh, Northfield senior Addie France auditioned last September and was accepted to the Indiana All-State Honors Choir, just like the Southland students, that sang at the Embassy Theater in Fort Wayne on Friday the 13th and Saturday, January 14th. She joined a handful of other students from Southwood, Manchester, and Wabash that made up of 300 plus singers from around the state. They sang a number of advanced choir songs that required many hours of individual practice. This was Addie's third All-State Honors Choir appearance. We are proud of Addie and her accomplishment of making All-State Honors Choir three years in a row. So excellent. Um, we have those students that are doing well in fine arts, those students are doing athletic, and those students are doing academically too. So we just really appreciate uh, the principals and all the staff who work with these students and then also take the time to put it on the recognition so you guys can hear those good things that are happening. So that's all I have for that tonight. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Before we move on, I missed in my notes. Who made the motion to approve the donations? Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Any public comment on agenda items? If not, we'll move to approve the minutes from both the prior reorganization meeting that we had on the 10th of January and also the regular meeting that followed on the 10th. We'll group those together. I have a motion. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Any questions on claims tonight? We need to vote. No, that's right. We got a different Okay. <laughs> All in favor of the motion to approve minutes for both those meetings, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we now claims. I had one on dark holding. Dark trace is a cyber security, it's a cyber security program that uh, we purchased to help keep us uh, out of trouble with any type of <clears throat> potentially <throat> ransomware or anything like that. This is the first year for that? Uh, I think it's the second, second year. And just to keep the board updated on those kinds of things also, just another school locally here, not locally, but north of us, um, not in Wabash County, um, had an attack, a ransomware attack, and so a lot of things that our tech department and Dr. Coon's doing to try to make sure that we don't have that because it will really, really, really disrupt the school district. So. We have to do everything we can to make that work. I move the claims. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. <clears throat> payroll? Uh, this is just the first payroll in January, so nothing out of the ordinary. Motion for that then? I move. Payroll. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Anything then on financial or we're skipping that tonight? Or? No, since we went over it. most of it the last board meeting and then did the. I can did go, I can go <laughs> over it again if you want to. <laughs> you beat it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have any. Okay, moving on then. <laughs> You can grab your HR. We have under employment this evening to consider. We have Samuel Cole, Tana Chellis, Brenda Carey, 
Tiffany lives say, and uh, that's all under employment. You can see the positions there. Tiffany would be head volleyball coach at North Hill for the coming year. Transfers, we have Amanda Rigney moving from English teacher at White's to English teacher for the bridge program. Chris Whitaker transferring from classroom supervisor to that English uh, teaching position at White's High School. Retirement is mentioned <clears throat> earlier as Tina Regal, and then termination number 150. I believe we have some other sports. Northville for spring coaches. Troy, <clears throat> Troy Schaefer, Stan Cox is baseball. Braden Rip, Ripplinger, baseball junior high, or JV. Greg Tomlinson, varsity baseball, and Joseph Mitchell, varsity baseball, Matt Burkhardt, varsity baseball. Uh, Marianne Milam, head tennis, Casey Dyson, JV tennis. AI uh, Seninko, I just want to take a shot at that. Man. No, I'm good. You just have to get to it. San Kiko. San Kiko. 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 Emphasizing the wrong consonant. Kyle France, softball. Carlos Delgado, softball. Abby Hunter, JV head softball. Emily Pennington, assisting JV softball. Jordan Ekman, also a volunteer assistant in softball. Nick uh, Galato, uh, volunteer assistant softball. Gary Hunter, Matt Schreider, and Jeff Crum, all volunteer assistants in softball. For track at Northfield this coming spring, we have Heather Hyden, head track. Larry Vaughn, varsity assistant. Krista Hoover, also varsity assistant. Tricia Oswald, junior high head track. Sarah Adderman, junior high assistant track. And Michelle Rice, also assisting in junior high track. I move to approve the HR report. That's from coaches first out. Was more? Yeah. Oh, was that? <laughs> 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 <You're right. laughs> with uh, spring coaches, we have Tanya Boone being the head track coach, Harry Hamill, assistant track, Chad Andrews, assisting, and Jacob Marlowe, assisting in track. Jeff Hobson <coughs> doing junior high track, uh, Danny Bassus, junior high track, and Natalie Younger, junior high track, and then Gary Dale heading up as head goal. It's south of it. So we have quite a list there. I second Scott's <laughs> motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all in favor of approving HR? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposition? Thank you. Mr. Bowman, if I can just mention though, I know that Mr. Martin already talked about Tina Regal, but we do appreciate um, she's had 36 years um, at MSD of Walvers <laughs> County. Um, so a great run, and um, we just thank her for all, all those many years, and just wish her well. But we do know that she has a few more months that she's going to work as hard as she can uh, to continue on with her students. But again, that's a, a long time, and we appreciate all those years of service of 36 years. Yeah, you have a couple big shoes, sets of shoes to fit. No, no doubt. No, no doubt. Tonight, just a little bit. Uh, we had our meeting last week, and the one thing that Mr. Hobbs he had a possible concern. I think it's House Bill 1002, uh, where there are the states looking at changing the way CTE monies are distributed. Uh, they're looking at a different way to fund CTE services. What is it similar to like the educational fund that that money that will follow the kid students uh, to different career centers? So I could create a mess or possibly, but he doesn't think it'll affect Heartland too much because we have five member schools and those positions are all taken or could be taken. So you wouldn't have people coming in and say, well, I want, but that hasn't passed yet. You can give more about that. No, and there's also another part of that is for general education, it's already being done with special education. Uh, Arizona is the one state that's doing a lot of that already. Um, and I think Indiana somewhat, some of the legislators are trying to tear, tailor it um, after that, but we'll just see what happens. It's, it's one of those things we don't know exactly what will happen, but something that we'll keep an eye on. Other than that, that's it. Just Thank something you. to be aware of that funding may change again. 
superintendent? Yeah, I don't have anything uh, formal tonight, but I did just want to mention that, you know, with this imminent uh, possible, I guess imminent and possible don't match up together. Um, <laughs> but uh, when we're talking about weather, maybe I can say that a winter storm, just a reminder to everyone um, that we, um, if we are, are canceled, we will transition to an e-learning day. Of course, this year we had the new schedule with the counting the minutes, uh, but we are continuing to have um, e-learning on those canceled days unless we go multiple days in a row. But we'll just have to wait and see about that part of it. So, um, but we do appreciate everybody's flexibility, especially flexibility with two hour delays also. We know that that's a situation that uh, for parents, um, you, you have to be flexible and that causes a disruption in their lives too. But uh, we are looking at being safe uh, with our students and with our staff and everyone involved. So uh, just appreciate all of that uh, flexibility and understanding. That's all. Mr. Curry? Yeah, uh, I included just a little bit of a report here. First, um, Purdue University and NAA University have kind of flagship universities for the state. So when we send stuff out for advice, we try to listen to that. Uh, and so I just pulled a board out from something they sent. But basically just saying, make sure your kids are taking some AP classes. Uh, there's a big push for dual credit and that has its place. So uh, they say, oh, you can read it there, but um, uh, that kind of supports our mission of making sure we offer those for kids that need those challenges, um, that good balance. Uh, underneath that, then another bill, uh, kind of like Mr. Driscoll brought up. Um, this one <clears throat> pertains to education pretty strongly. Uh, we have books for standards for math, and science, and social studies for every grade and for every class. And the General Assembly has passed the Department of Education with reducing those standards, um, which most teachers will tell you is a good idea. We have so many standards and not possible really to cover them all in the amount of time we have or to at least cover them in a way that kids can actually you know understand what you're trying to get through and so uh, by law they're going to have to reduce those 25 to 33 percent and so they've started that process but we will be getting new standards for the teachers for our classrooms like and so it's it'll just kind of it'll give us a chance to kind of revamp where we're at with that but that'll happen over the next uh, year or two and then finally down at the bottom, um, I think we mentioned this before, but just to remind you, we're starting to look for science material. <laughs> Actually, tomorrow <laughs> is the day we were supposed to go to Fort Wayne. And so, so I'll be heading to Northfield to get an activity bus to drive our science teachers to Fort Wayne tomorrow. Should we not have inclement weather at either our school or at the Fort Wayne community? Yeah, schools. Yeah, 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 so we'll have to see here uh, whether we get stranded on 69 with a, yeah. So the uh, textbook caravan, which ironically last year we did math at this time, and the same day the school system had a delay, but we forged through and made it up there. Um, but this time they're offering a virtual presentation. And so we will, if inclement weather comes up, we will connect with those vendors virtually and then get their materials in hand. Uh, we are looking to get print material as much as we can uh, textbooks to have kids to promote that reading, literacy, and science. And so um, the timetable right now, <laughs> the goal is to get all this stuff so we get it to you guys by March, by the end of March, so we can have it for public preview before you officially get it on there. Let's make sure we get community input. So, so, so Mr. Keefaber needs to make his decision early enough. Early enough so I don't have to drive to the field. <laughs> I'd be kind of him to, you know. <laughs> Save me that trouble. I think he sees one snowflake. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, just to, actually, just a cloud. That's all. <laughs> just a cloud. Just a cloud. All right. Thanks, Mr. <laughs> we have three items under new business this evening. The first one being the approval of the 2020 or the 23-24 calendar which is subject to change yes and so you don't really want me to go through everything here and i'm not going to do that but i do want to say just like mr <coughs> bowen said uh, this is definitely subject to change due to current and or possible new legislation so as you know from last year the state of indiana said that we could only count three a maximum of three asynchronous days um, and you could do as many synchronous as you want but you could only do eight, uh, three and then uh, the DOE came back and told us, talked to us a little bit more about the 1003 flexibility waiver, which uh, you guys um, did approve the, the resolution. We applied for it, it was approved. 
And so we're counting minutes this year instead of um, actual 180 days. Um, so that was just a one year waiver. Um, and so we will continue to apply for that waiver, uh, but there's talk that it might be more difficult to get through that process this year. So we don't know what's gonna happen for sure. And there has been some talk too that maybe the state would go and allow for more asynchronous days. So again, I will stress that we will put this out to the public um, upon your uh, approval, uh, but it is subject to change due to current and or possible new legislation. And we did have to change the calendar last year, um, late in the year because of that legislation. And we do know that the, um, uh, the session will last uh, through April, could be longer, but through April, so there might be some changes late. And so we apologize for that. But again, we know people are flexible. This calendar is very similar to last year's calendar. Christmas break is a little bit different because it's the two full weeks. It's still 10 days uh, for students. Uh, and last year, or this last year, yes, was 10 days also. But since Christmas falls on a Monday, we go through a Friday, and then we come back on a Monday. Um, and it all depends typically on when Christmas falls. And so it is very similar to last year's calendar. So I would ask that you uh, would approve this calendar with the caveat of the double asterisk at the top. I move to approve this uh, schedule. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> One thing I did fail to mention though, part of this whole discussion is that we have five member schools like Mr. Driscoll talks about being a part of the Heartland Career Center. So we try to match those up as much as possible with the other four school districts that feed into uh, Heartland Career Center and also Wabash Miami area program, knowing that um, there are some tweaks here and there. But it's my understanding that we are gonna be fairly simple, uh, similar. Uh, we already know that North Miami had already created their own calendar for two years. And so it looks almost identical. Uh, Wabash and Manchester are still uh, uh, in conversations about that, but they told me it probably would look the same, but they don't know for sure. Um, and they have some other different ideas too. And then finally, uh, Peru typically does things more with some of the other Miami County schools, um, i.e. Uh, McConaughey. Uh, but theirs might be off a little bit, but hopefully a little bit closer to, to match up with Barbara. Just a better <coughs> The second item of new business would be the recommendation of the board to approve the administration moving forward with the bonding process for both summer and fall projects in 2023. Do you need to address time for anyone in concrete? No, so as, soon, um, as soon as possible. Yeah, our next our next action, I guess, would be getting with bond council and trying to figure out filling out a debt structure like we talked about in, in the finance meeting a little bit in regards to um, some projects that we have potentially upcoming that we'd like to get in this calendar year if possible getting started. I move to the recommendation of the bonding process for some of the four projects. Second. I have a motion and a second on that item of business. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? All right, thank you. The third one is the recommendation to approve overnight out of state field trip for Northfield 7th and 8th grade choirs for the music in the parts in Kings Island on the 19th and 20th of May. And I believe they've done that before, right? I believe this is the new one. Uh, we've done other things uh, with like physics classes and things like that to Cedar Point or Kings Island. Kings Island. Uh, or, yeah, Cedar Point. Right. <clears throat> I need to approve the, the uh, out of state field trip. Second. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nothing under unfinished business, but we do have something under board policy this evening. The first reading of revised, revised number 4085 on attendance. Yes, yeah, so our handbooks um, were changed a, a couple of years ago as far as attendance, and the actual policy um, needed to be changed really because of some Indiana Code and DOE recommendations. And so 
Again, this is just the first reading, so if there are questions that you have afterwards, we can talk about those because we don't ask for approval of this until um, the end. So if you look at the second page there, basically we're talking uh, changing the eight to five as far as absences per semester. Um, we do not have our handbooks and our uh, policy match, and so we need to get that matched. And this is the proper way of doing it as far as the five and not the eight. So uh, those were the changes. Also um, making some note about uh, language from truancies to unexcused. There are definitely definite definitions for truancy compared to unexcused. Um, also just changing some minor things since we looked at it from social worker to staff because we have guidance counselors and social workers. So we just group it up to staff. Um, and then we took some language out um, to make it just more uh, to go along with the handbook. Uh, the work permits that was still in that policy uh, we no longer, um, schools do not uh, deal with work permits anymore. That's Indiana code also. And so we had to strike all that out. And then the attendance policies were just really asking, um, uh, having the parents or actually this policy say that it's more based on what you look at as far as the handbook. Because we know sometimes the handbook is more specific than the actual policies. So actually there's quite a bit that's been stricken from the policy. Um, but it all goes back to your handbook too, which you approve on a yearly basis. So if there are questions now or later, uh, but not asking for approval now, but just uh, it shows. So bottom line, this brings it in line with handbook. Correct. Okay. Question under attendance procedures. I, maybe I'm not reading right. If a pattern of excessive attendance develops, how do you have excessive attendance? <laughs> They're coming too much? They come on Saturday. I, can't keep them away. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> probably, probably meant to be excessive yeah. absences. Yeah, yeah. And the, the word, right. thank you. Yeah, yeah the words. Right <laughs> well, we can talk about this too, because irregular. I guess when we're talking about irregular, that word is can be associated with other things too, and so uh, that needs to be changed. So. We don't encourage excessive attendance. No. Nope. Yeah. 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 Actually, actually, this won't leave school. Actually, there will be some students tomorrow if we cancel that would rather be in school. So that excessive. would be excessive. 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 <laughs> so I guess I beg to differ on some of this, but uh, all right. Josh, what did you say would be better on that? So I think it reads uh, a pattern of excessive absence. Yeah. Yeah, excessive yeah. attendance. Because it was written previously irregular attendance. Now yeah. it's excessive yeah. absence. That's why we do this. That's why there's a first and second reading so we can make sure we catch all these things. Yeah, that, that was excellent. Was that in my reading light. That was a test. That was a test. Yeah, that was a test. It was a test. You have to ask a show or class. Well, I wish I could say that. <laughs> Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Well, that, that looks so irregular about this uh, <laughs> policy. We'll have a second reading on that next meeting. Yes, yeah, so and we'll uh, try to get that corrected. We'll check. It. <laughs> Might leave it in there just to make sure you read it. Again. Okay. <laughs> just in case we forget. <laughs> Opened up to public comments on all items for this evening. Items from the board, anything? Yes, no, then we're adjourned. 714.